Hi everybody, I'm Bill Whittle here with my friend Alfonso Rachel and this is the Virtue Signal brought to you by the new member drive uh, that we had back in a couple months ago here at BillWhittle.com. Uh, so today we got, it's not exactly a two-part episode, but I thought we might take a look at, at two qualities that are sort of mirror images of each other. Mm. Uh, one of them is arrogance, but the one I want to start with is, uh, is self-pity. Um, mm. There's obviously, I think before we start on anything, and by the way, it's a suggestion from one of our members. I think it's an excellent topic. Before we start, just so everybody understands that we're clear on this, when we talk about self-pity, we're not talking about the reaction of a man who may have suddenly lost his entire family in an auto accident and is, and mm. is just drinking himself out of his pain. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about self-pity as a psychological defense against success. Mm-hmm. as as something that you use as a shield to either justify the failures that you may have had so far or I think more often to prevent you from trying in the first place. Oh, you know, I, I, I came from – my language isn't good or I had a bad background, I didn't have enough education. Whatever the case may be, uh, there is a quality about poor, poor, pitiful me that it's not just uh, – uncomfortable to look at it's really crippling it removes it removes your own authorship from your life yeah yeah um and you and, and anybody can struggle with this bill i struggle struggle with it myself it's like man am i constantly having a pity party like over the you know the things that have happened to me and um you know one has to be really careful with it and uh and you know, Moses went through the same thing. <clears throat> it actually got on God's nerves, right? It ticked God off. <laughs> you, <know? laughs> so, you really should. I, I, I mean this. I mean this with the greatest respect. I don't mean this in a flip way. But I really would love to read you do a translation of the Bible. Honestly, I think that'd be a heck of a read. <laughs> hey, well, you know, if if uh, if I may, that's what I do. <clears throat> that I is do, what you do. Yeah, that is know, what you do. And uh, you know, if folks want to join me on the on the Zopium Dan. You know, that's what we do. The anti fuddy duddy Bible study, if you will, and. Um, but, you know, in relating to that, because Moses said, that, and I think of the same way, I, I feel like I tend to ramble. Uh, I stutter, like when I, you know, when I, when I talk, you know, and uh, I, a lot of times I don't feel comfortable about my speaking. Moses went through the same things like, hey, God, you know, look, man, I'm not a well-spoken person. I'm not very eloquent, you know, and all that sort of stuff. And God's like, fine, man, I'll have your brother do it. He's the oldest anyway, you know, but it turns mm-hmm. out that, that uh, Moses did end up becoming the chief per se. Um, so, but we do that, you know, um, and, you know, it's like you said earlier, we don't want to downplay when somebody has the rug pulled up from underneath them. Sometimes yeah. it really is just hard to get back up. And sometimes it's not a, about a defense of why it is that you're not succeeding. Sometimes it's an explanation because people want to know. It's like, look, you know, uh, like say, for instance, in my case, people say, hey, Zoe, I haven't seen you in years. You know what happened to you? And sometimes you just feel like, well, let me offer you up up, up an explanation. Mm-hmm. I am still doing what I do. You just don't see me, you know. But at some point, you know, you just can't keep relying on that. You have to you have to be diligent in trying to find another angle. So let's take an example, a, a, like a ludicrous example, just to really turn up the contrast on it. Mm. Let's say that I'm uh, when I was a, in high school, I was the uh, captain of the football team and I was the star quarterback and we were playing for the state championship. And uh, I threw a pass and the, and the referee uh, called it uh, a fumble when it was clearly an incomplete pass. And that judgment cost us the game. And because it cost us the game, I feel it cost me my NFL career. And because it cost me my NFL career, I'm basically going to spend the rest of my life reliving that bad call, which let's, for the sake of the argument, say it was a bad call. It was a genuine injustice. Again, I'm exaggerating the example, but basically now all of the dreams that I had and all of the energy and the enthusiasm I had, I'm going to just basically put that away. I'm just going to be bitter. I'm going to dwell in the past. I'm going to live in the past and keep going back to that moment when I could have made it. And then this external thing happened to me. This person made a bad judgment or this person fired me for no reason or this institution turned me down when clearly I'm capable of whatever the case may be. I'm talking about self-pity as the as the um, willingness to allow the, the the bad breaks in life, which everybody gets, to paralyze you. 
Sure, man. You, you, you end up with that, uh, what's that? You ever see that movie Napoleon Dynamite, man? You get that Uncle yeah. Rico syndrome, right? It's like, man. Exactly right, exactly. <laughs> uh, filming myself doing my incredible pass. Yeah, that's right. a sad guy to be. Indeed, it's man. It's a really sad guy to be. It is, man. Well, you want a time machine, man. I wish I could go back in time, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and you will look for all these, and, and you know, the Word of God calls this um, an example of this uh, as, as a dog returning to its vomit. Right. It's it's you just keep revisiting this thing, you know, and it could be lots of things, man, uh, where people will keep themselves in this pity party. Um, and, and, and these things, man, if you're going to put the energy into that, work your energy into into trying to be innovated, you know, being diligent, not not pouring into, you know, always revisiting this excuse of why you're not succeeding. Um, and, and just like you said, but it, this can befall anybody. But at some point, you know, you, you look at other you can see it in other people. You don't like it about other people. Well, it might be a, a quality that you might want to examine about yourself and move forward from there. Yeah, I think anybody who spends a lot of time dreaming about a time machine and wishing they could go back and change <laughs> one thing, I think they're I think they are really um, destroying their own lives because there are no time machines and you can't go back and change it. No matter no. how much you want to, it's done. Right. And and you may have suffered genuine horrific injustice, and. And that is what it is. And you can strive for justice, for remedy, all of that. But but to live in a world where it's constantly, you know, if I if I could have just undone that or if that hadn't happened, mm. let's talk about it on on kind of a larger scale. Mm. Uh, one of the one of the things about this this latest trumpeting of of, of white privilege and white supremacy and so on is obviously designed to get uh, liberals anyway, white liberals, as guilty as possible and mm. as pliable as possible. Mm. But it also is a, a reinforcement of this idea that if I'm not white, I can't possibly succeed because everything is against me and, and, and the system is designed to keep me down and all the rest of it. And, and look, I've, I've had those feelings before, too. And as I got a little older, I realized, you know, the system is to the degree that some institutional thing or whatever is, is pushing me down. I'm not really that important. You know what I mean? It's not like there's a <laughs> giant international cabal designed to keep uh, to keep Bill Whittle from prosperity. That that aspect of it, that that sense of um, why even bother? The man's against you, or this is against you, or what is against you? It serves a political purpose for people who don't have uh, your very best interest in, in in heart. Well, you know, we it seems like we're in a generation where uh, we feel like everything should have like a delete button or an undo button. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and for some reason, people think that they can undo these things that have been done by strangely making the same mistakes that got us into this uh, uh, this place in the first place. And one of those things is being obsessed with race. Yep. And, um, and race, you know, in itself, is a, is a misappropriated, you know, word. It, when we keep talking about race, we're all, we're automatically instilling in people's head that we're in a competition with each other, mm -hmm. right? Um, we're we're oh, wow uh, because of the nature of the word, right? That's that's that's. I, never, I cannot believe that never occurred to me, but that's a profound insight. Yeah, that's, yes, it's a race. Yes, somebody's going to come in first, and somebody's going to come in last. That's right, man. It's a, dude. That's uh, that's really amazing. You know, the the word of God recognizes us as nations. Right. We're, we're a nation of people in this in this nation that we have. We are a nation of people. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, it's like you're you represent a nation. I represent a nation. But, you know, Bill, you're my friend. You're not my friend of this nation. When I think of Bill Whittle, I don't think of my white friend, Bill Whittle. But, That's, we're, yeah. you know, but we're made to think that way. And another uh, misappropriation of terms, uh, um, Bill, that 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 the that the nation, our, our country is caught up with is the term ethnicity. Right. That's another gross misappropriation of words. Ethnicity has nothing to do with your skin color. It has nothing. When you break the word down, the word ethnic means a nation. If this is this is what the Hebrews described it as. You're a nation that is a, not a nation of God. Your God is not the God Jehovah or the God uh, Adonai. It's not your God. That's what ethnos means. So when. When in our country, when we have to fill in that paper, what's your ethnicity or what's your race or anything like that? You're not affirming your ethnicity as a white person or your ethnicity as a black person. What you're doing when you answer that question of your ethnicity is that you are affirming your state of godlessness. That is what ethnicity means. But the nation has been subliminally 
um, given over to accepting that we are a state that is not under God. That's what we're being led into. So we can see these things play out in our insecurity. Remember when we talked about our nation's model in mm-hmm. God we trust? No, yep. Bill, we don't trust in God. What we do is we trust in our skin color. That's what people have been made to believe, that our, our redemption is in our skin color and our salvation is in our, is in our skin color. Our kingdom is in our skin color. These are the things that we're being made to be forced to believe. And this is like the word of God says, this is when nations rise up against nations and kingdoms will rise up against kingdoms because we're being forced to be insecure about our own nation. We're being forced to be insecure and be prejudiced against somebody else's nation and kingdom. Yeah, I find that that's beautifully said. And I find it not only uh, ironic and sad, but also very um, illuminating that there are people today who feel the sting of slavery much more than their grandparents ever did, mm. which I find a little odd. And and this this left-wing idea of, of constantly breaking the country into tribes, setting tribes against each other. Mm. The main reason for doing this is to provide victimhood status. Mm-hmm. Now, there's a difference between a victim and victimhood. Uh, victims are people that deserve our sympathy and our, and our genuine pity mm-hmm. in some cases, and certainly our, our assistance and comfort. But victimhood is, is, a, is a cloak that you put on. Mm. Victimhood is a garment wow. that, that, you, that you wear which you perceive to be something that actually gains you in status. And that's exactly where we are now. The people, the, the moral situation that's being forced on us now has nothing to do with what you did or didn't do. It has mm. nothing to do with your value as a person, as an individual. It's a question of who can put on the most colorful cloak mm. of, of victimhood and self-pity. And that person is automatically elevated. And so now we find ourselves in a world where not only are people looking for the slightest, well, not even looking for, inventing um, harms and microaggressions and all that other stuff, because it basically empowers the suit they're wearing. It, 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 it's, like a, it's like a level up, you know? Mm. Somebody, th- this is the, I think this is like the Jesse Smollett <laughs> thing in, in a nutshell. It, he was trying to level up, right? Or, or level down, depending on your perspective. <laughs> right. Here's a guy who's who's basically you know a, a, a TV star and, and the world laid out at his feet. That's not enough for him. Mm. If he can show that he's the victim of a of a hate based assault, it's a power crystal. It it increases his victimhood, increases his his moral authority, mm-hmm. increases his publicity certainly, and and it's certainly not restricted to Jesse Smollett or black people either. Everybody has. Not everybody. A lot of people have <clears throat> mechanisms to increase their self-pity and their victimhood. A classic example is the kind of person that's always is sick, uh, like a hypochondriac, although more of a, I guess, gold bricker was the first term that came into mind. But somebody who's <laughs> always, always saying whenever anything has to be done, it, well, Dr. Smith, right? Oh, my aching back. Oh, oh, my delicate back. I can't possibly <laughs> stack these crates with my delicate condition. There are people with delicate conditions, mm-hmm. but a lot of people use or invent or exaggerate mm-hmm. anything that might be seen as a weakness and use it to not only prevent themselves from, from doing work, but also to prevent other people from asking or getting them to do some work. Man, uh, that, that oxymoron of empowered victims, right? It's like, yeah. that's where we are. We're, 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 uh, empowered victims. Yes. You know, we're, we're in a state where we're in a competition of who's the bigger victim. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's old, man, but it's the fashion. It's the fashion of the day. And it's not, it's not a new thing. It's just one of those things that just comes back in cycles. And, you know, when you, when you talk about this cloak, Bill, you're, man, you're, you're right. And, but, you know, this cloak could be used, this cloak of many colors could be used a better way. And we're in these days, and it's it's been a long time that we've been doing this. When people associate, you know, being of service, uh, servitude, they 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 stigmatize it by associating it with, with slavery, and mm-hmm. people are too proud to be of service to other people. They want to be served, right? Mm-hmm. And you know, man, we could take a clue from uh, from Joseph, man. Uh, you know, speaking of a, a cloak of many colors, that's what Joseph had. His father, you know, he was like, you know, the, the favorite youngest son, right? And his brothers couldn't stand him, right? So, mm-hmm. and, and you know, his pops gave him like this cloak of many colors. 
you know, and he would sport this cloak and stuff like that. And his brothers, basically, they wanted to kill him. So, you know, they threw him in a pit, <clears throat> long story short, and he ended up being sold into slavery. So now what did Joseph do? Did he butt hurt about this condition that he was in? No, he made sure that he was of the best service that he could be. As the word of God says, hey, if, if the soldier tells the servant to carry his armor one mile, carry it two. Right. This isn't sucking up to him or anything like this. This gets you into a position where it's like, man, I respect you more than my own troop, my own yeah, troops. That's right. You know what I'm saying? So Joseph did the same thing and Joseph earned respect everywhere earned he it. went. Earned that's right. It. Worked for it. Right. Did it did extra. Exactly. Yeah. Until he became viceroy of Egypt. So it's like, you know, we have this mindset, though, Bill, you know, we, we feel like we have to be served and we go through these uh, these entitled you know, loops that we go through to think that, hey, at some point somebody's going to serve us. And it's like, no, what you're wanting to do is that you're wanting to put people in slavery while condemning people for slavery. Yeah. And and like everything else, you know, in society, especially in modern American society, which is so fluid, mm. um, the relationships are constantly changing. Mm. Uh, I was a limo driver when I first got out here mm. for four years. And that is a relatively menial job. It's nice to be able to drive a nice car, but basically you stand at the airport and somebody says, those are my bags, take them to the car, mm -hmm. drive me home, that kind of thing. It's not like Uber at all. <laughs> uh, and you, and no, I'm serious, it's nothing like Uber. You, wear your, you, know, you I had a triple knit polyester suit. You could throw a turkey dinner on that thing, just hose it off. It was, mm. this is the, the uniform and this is my job. And I stand there and I carry people's bags, put them in the car and so on. Mm. And during the times that I would sometimes feel like, man, I'm just stuck in this. I'm never going to get out of it. And, and you know, and, I just remember every now and then saying to myself, yes, but I could take this chauffeur's salary that I'm making and save a little bit of it, and then I could go to Las Vegas and check in, and now people are serving me. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, okay, that's their job. Mm -hmm. And and it, it's not my identity, mm -hmm. you know, it's my job. It's what I'm doing, and I hope to do better someday, but even if I don't, that's, that's kind of okay. The, I guess to close on this thing, I just think that when I think about the people I admire the most, but just as general rule, mm. used to admire the most, the people that we used to admire the most were people who overcame incredible adversity. Mm -hmm. That to me is always the, the, the human story that just rings that silver bell yeah. in the middle of your soul. You know, you think you've got it bad and you hear some story. Like we keep coming back to Booker T. Washington, but mm. he's a great example. And I love your t-shirt, by the way. So oh, there's you. another one, Frederick Douglass. Mm. You talk about uh, Abraham Lincoln, anybody. Mm. You talk about people who've overcome adversity and you were really talking about the antithesis of self-pity. Mm -hmm. You're talking about people who have every possible excuse in the world to go down that road. Uh, every excuse you could ever list of, well, I didn't do this or I couldn't do that or this happened to me and so on, but they don't let it become the author of their lives. They realize that any point in your life, any point in your life, you can make a decision to be the author of your own life and not be a raft, be a powerboat. Yes. And, and that to me is a quality that's disappearing as we continue this victim worship mm -hmm. and aside from all the political and societal problems, what it's really doing is it's stealing people's futures from them. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and when people take these things, you know, these figures that you're, that you're talking about who had real challenges, man, really real adversity, and it's been reduced, man, heck with it, defiled by people who wanna take those same plights Plights that were imposed by the Democrats, you know, who wanted to maintain this apartheid policy over, over people. And these, you have people today who are trying to associate things like their sexuality or what gender that they want to be or, or people who want to come into the country illegally. And then they want to take the plights that Frederick Douglass faced and that yep. Booker T. Washington faced. And, and make it their own. Oh, this is Jim Crow all over again. Or, or there was a time when whites and blacks couldn't be married. How come you're objecting to to, to men and men? And said, so, whoa, whoa, whoa. This we're talking about a, a, an inherent a nation of people as opposed to behavior. You're trying to associate your behavior with what what it is that we what, that uh, my ancestors had to go through. It's not the same boat. It's not even the same ocean. And you have totally uh, uh, besmirched, you know, and and defiled 
what it is that people who went through real struggle, it's like your, your struggle is that you don't know which bathroom to go to, as opposed to people who are told that they can't go into this bathroom because of their skin color. Yeah, it's like, exactly. you know, come on, you know, and, but that's where we are today, just like we talked about, but it's like people in this competition of who's the, you know, the bigger victim and trying to be empowered in this victimhood. And if they really want to talk about resist, right? That's the whole thing, resist now. It's like, look, resist the, the, what's going on in your mental state that is causing you to do something that is against the laws of nature. If you can't even respect the laws of nature, you will not even respect the moral law of the nation. You, you're not a respecter of laws. And please don't drag us into that or use us as a sympathy vote for your cause. Yeah. Yeah. Ultimately, in a free country, you can do whatever you want, mm -hmm. but that doesn't give you the right to make us do whatever you want. Thank you. Uh, yeah. And I think I think that uh, just to close this, uh, one of the things that strikes me the most is when I hear people complaining about income inequality, mm -hmm. I often want to ask them about output inequality. Mm -hmm. When I hear people saying, oh, this guy's got this incredible car, this incredible house and all this other stuff, my first reaction is to want to say, OK, well, would you be willing to spend a year putting in the hours that this guy puts in? Mm. Are you willing to do that? You know, usually the people that have succeeded have succeeded through just tremendous amounts of hard work. And and if you're second or third generation wealthy, you're you're almost certainly designed to spend money uh, that you didn't earn and you end up back down at the bottom and the cycle repeats again. Yes. Uh, that'll do it for this edition of the Virtue Signal made possible by all the members of BillWhittle.com, but especially those of you who joined us recently. Uh, for my friend and colleague Alfonso Rachel, I'm Bill Whittle. We'll see you here next time.